Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is more of a troubling trend maybe than a fact, but it's related to today's interview. And it's that 124 million boys and girls worldwide are in the highest weight range. And over the last 40 years, the number of kids and teens with obesity has just skyrocketed. In 1975, we're estimating about five or six million boys were obese. In 2016, it went to 50 million girls and 74 million boys, according to a report published last year. And the incidence of childhood obesity has slowed or leveled off in some high-income countries. It's continuing to grow in other parts of the world, especially in Asia. According to pediatricians, this is caused by globalization of bad diet and inactivity, lots of processed foods and sugary drinks, and urbanization. These are big things that are happening. And I'm calling this out because I used to weigh 300 pounds. I had arthritis when I was 14 and I was obese as a teenager. And actually it kind of sucked. And I'm hoping that by listening to the show, you might learn a thing or two about what you can do to not be obese yourself. Maybe help a kid in your neighborhood or in your family um, or anywhere else avoid some of that stuff because really no one should have to do that. And if you like the show, before we get going, take a second to go to bulletproof.com slash iTunes, which takes you right to the Apple page where you can leave a review that says that the show is worth your time, because I sure hope it is. I think it's worth my time anyway. Today's guest is Dr. Michelle Perro. She's a 37-year veteran of pediatrics in acute care medicine and integrative medicine, and she's been on the front line of caring for children. And over the past couple decades, she's seen this sharp decline in kids' health and a big increase in the environmental load our children are experiencing, so much that she wrote a book called What's Making Our Children Sick. She's also the executive director of a nonprofit website that explores the links between genetically modified food and the pesticides that come with it and health. Today, we're going to talk about how her book presents a roadmap to help you as a parent or maybe as a kid, a practitioner, health educator, just understand what's going on in the landscape so we can talk about microbiology of the gut, talk about scientific studies of what glyphosate actually does to human beings as well as to our soil, and hear from someone on the front line of dealing with kids who get sick and don't get better without a lot of heavy work. Dr. Perro, welcome to the show. Dave, thank you for having me. I'm delightful to be here. You're uh, a heavyweight doctor in, in that you, you do acute care, you, you do emergency stuff in pediatrics, which is one of the most challenging things to do. Like, like you've, you've come at this from the hardcore Western medicine side. And here you are talking about genetically modified foods and functional medicine. What the heck happened to get you off the mainstream wagon? I ask myself that every day, Dave. So what happened to me happens to so many of us who have fi find ourselves in integrative or functional medicine. I prefer those terms to so alternative or complementary. And what first happened was my own son was not well 24, 25 years ago. And I had the serendipitous encounter, nothing brilliant on my part, um, to meet a homeopath. And she lectured me on how to fix Jesse, my son. And, and my son has given me permission to talk about him, by the way. He's, mm -hmm. he's in the book. No, sorry, Jay. Um, and lo and behold, this stuff worked. So I started putting my toe in the water of like, whoa, what is this stuff? So you went straight to homeopathy as a Western doctor? Yes, because it worked the second time and the third time. And I said, okay, you mean to tell me I can buy a $7 little bottle of sugar pills and it's going to cure my son's life-threatening illness. So I said, I need to know more about this. And I started digging in deep into homeopathy. That word alone makes Western docs quake in their boots. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, and I, I never thought of talking to you today, we're going to start with homeopathy, but I'm going to be honest. This is the transparent, true life story. And so I started digging and digging and learning and educating myself. And all of a sudden, I became a homeopath. I opened up my own urgent care, practicing uh, Western and homeopathic medicine and other integrative stuff. And then, boom, I get hit with, hey, Michelle, we're trying to stop the spray of this pesticide in Marin County and along the entire coast of California by a group of moms. And we need a pediatrician. Can you do it? And I thought, heck no, I'm a busy mom. 
you got to be kidding me. I'm working, kids, soccer, crazy life. And as many women, I said, uh, sure, be happy to. Would love to do that for you. And these gals, they did the he- heavy lifting, Dave. I just went along for the ride until one of those moms. Oh, we stopped the spray, by the way. Nice. Um, yeah, it was. Oh, you don't know how good that was. And so one of those moms said, hey, what do you think about GMOs? 2006. And I didn't have a thought about GMOs. And I said, okay, look into Jeffrey Smith's book. She insisted I read it. And as a pediatrician, you have to appreciate when smart parents speak to you, you listen. That's what we're trained to do. I listened, read the book, learned about the work of Dr. Arpad Pusti, and people on your show have talked about him in the past, and light bulbs were popping off in my head because seeing his work, I made the connection of gut disturbances and these chronic diseases I was beginning to see in my practice for the past 15 or 20 years. And that's the big story on how it all happened. So these are new things because you have enough of a timeline in your practice. Kids get sick in a certain way and suddenly you saw over what period of time, like over a five-year swing where all of a sudden people are sick Yes, people start getting sick differently. So, you know, I'd say about 20 years ago, I've been doing acute pediatrics for 37 years. Kids would get sick, they get an ear infection, you give them whatever you need to give them or nothing, and they get better. What around about 15 years ago, I saw kids with ear infection, let's say an eight month old, super common in children, and it would be their fifth ear infection. A kid we wrote about in the book, uh, she had 20 antibiotic courses by the time she was two. Kids were developing acute on chronic diseases and evidence of chronic inflammation. They also had evidence of a lack of robust immune systems where they were unable to fight stuff. And I started looking into gut health, started training myself in functional medicine or integrative medicine. And I, in essence, trained myself to be a naturopath is what I did. I love naturopathy. And I started evaluating these kids and gut function. And the I was pretty horrified as to what I was finding. What did you find? So glad you asked, Dave, because I'll tell you. <laughs> so I found kids with two interesting things as a baseline. Now, now in, in our kind of work, functional medicine, integrative, we look at individuality, but there are common denominators. I found evidence of intestinal permeability, leaky gut, especially in my patients with complex chronic disease. I'd say 95% of them had evidence of elevated food antibodies, wow. elevated zonulin. I can go into what all this means if you like, but concomitantly, yeah. I also found evidence of dysbiosis. I love checking the microbiome. And I started saying, wait a minute, this is abnormal. I saw evidence of lack of beneficial bacteria, evidence of overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria, bad players, yeast out of control, not enough digestive enzymes, markers of inflammation, and and kids who didn't feel well, by the way. Clinically, these tests, which are adjuncts, match the clinical picture. So you just looked at what you were seeing, you saw a difference. And this resonates a lot with me. I was on antibiotics pretty much every month for 15 years for chronic sinus infections and strep throat. And the environment might have something to do with that, not just a lack of antibiotics. (laughs) And man, I wish someone would have told me that when I was younger, uh, because that would have been a real life-changing thing. And I also sympathize with parents. Look, my kid's sick. You know, they're, they're, you know, their nose is exploding and I need something that works. And antibiotics do work in the short term, but they set you up for more of a failure. So a a lot of newer doctors maybe haven't seen this change. Kids have always been getting sick the way that they are now, but you saw this and you took action. And I I want to go back to the homeopathy because that's probably the most, it's probably the most (laughs) radioactive term. And I, I, I will admit I'm a computer scientist engineer and I grew up in a house where like, like only a, a crazy person would consider homeopathy because there's nothing in the water. And now I funded research at University of Washington about core water chemistry with Gerald Pollack. And I understand water is a little more complex than we thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what shifted gears for me was the guy who finally figured out I had a fungal problem and toxic mold had, had been a big trigger for me was a Johns Hopkins ENT surgeon. And he said, well, my patients don't get better. So what do I do? And eventually he ended up as a homeopath as well and was practicing in Los Altos, California, a guy named uh, Dr. Tim Guilford. And 
when I heard that you know, a top ranked surgeon like that, who's just looking for the solution would eventually end up even considering it and saying, look, I just see clinical results. I, I get rid of allergies. Like it just seems to work. I at least suspended my disbelief to the point and say, all right, there's a, enough people I know who are not crazy or getting results who use this modality that I'm willing to say, I have no idea how it works, but it appears that it works at least some of the time for some people more than placebo. It's all good. But I, I mean, how many barbs have you taken as a quote, real doctor for being an early person talking about that? You know, um, I tend not to go into this because the amount of stone throwing <laughs> that I've had to um, <clears throat> face over the decades has been pretty intense. And I'm a sensitive soul. I'm a pediatrician for Pete's sake. Come on. Um, and my <laughs> okay. skin has like grown in layers that I can't even begin to share with you because the level of disbelief marginalization and often outright hostility because I do this type yeah. of medicine, which is anti-pharmaceutical, but um, has been profound. However, I have not wanted to get in the platform of homeopathy because of the amount of vehemence by Western practitioners against homeopathy. So I said, okay, and people, moms will often get on board. Dads, <laughs> not, not to generalize, uh -huh. um, are often disbelieving, uh, want to see lab data. And I say, look, Here's what we'll do. You try it, give it a whirl, you do the experiment, your N of one, and you get back to me and you let me know how it works for you. Now, I've got to say, Dave, um, proof's in the pudding for me. I'm a New Yorker. I'm kind of like a practical gal. And I don't want to take up your time or spend your money with things that don't work. Okay. Yep. So I've been doing homeopathy, I'd say 20 years. I've been doing this chronic stuff for about, oh, let's say 15 years, you know, the real chronically ill kids. And I'd say of all the chronic kids I take care of, at some point, the majority, like 90% have received some homeopathic treatment. And I have all kinds that I use. And I'd have to say the majority of them have gotten better. Occasionally, I have a case that of a kid, it, you know, they're complicated. I've gotten it better. I cannot claim 100% success rate. That is not truthful and not realistic. Majority have gotten better with homeopathy as one of the legs of my stool that I use. I now need more than homeopathy to get kids better. As part of this emerging decline in kids' health, homeopathy is one a stool, like of my stool, nutraceuticals of various types, and herbals. And in the center of my stool, yoga, mind-body, stress reduction, little kids, teaching them how to do pressure points for various emotions, um, acupressure, et cetera. So all these various modalities I now include in the practice with kids as young as two and three years old. That's uh, that's all encompassing. And it, it it's remarkable, especially because you're a classically trained doctor who does acute care and things like that, but you're willing to use whatever tools are at your disposal. Let's, let's zoom in a bit on the gut. And I I used to think it was pretty normal just growing up this way where like if I couldn't clear a room with my gas, I just wasn't doing very well that day. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that was just a fact of life. And it's, it's to the point where like if, if I, I, I mean, I don't want to talk about, you know, how my farts smell here, but let's just say it's not a problem for me anymore uh, at all. And I, I've quantified my gut with the Viome test. I, I'm an advisor to the company and I have high diversity and high richness and my gut bacteria work better probably than they ever have in my life. Congratulations. Uh, but man, it, it took, you know, at this point, I've spent a million dollars on upgrading my biology, way more than I ever should have had to spend. And, and frankly, some of that's just seeing what's possible. But it took a couple hundred thousand dollars to get better. And it should have taken about, oh, maybe a thousand dollars and some better food. Like, like it, it's not that big of a deal when you're working with a practitioner who has the knowledge that's available today. 20 years ago, uh, it was exceptionally rare. Uh, and I'm sure that glyphosate was part of the problem. I, I know I'm sensitive to foods that have it. But if a parent's listening to this now, or you know, let's say someone you know, 30 years old who's maybe not a parent, but saying, well, I know my gut doesn't work that well, and I don't have the energy I want to have at the end of the day, how, how quickly do you go to the gut as a first place to look? I'd say like a zoom, Dave. It's a zoom to the gut. If the gut is not functioning well, and if you're eating uh, pesticide, GMO food, et cetera, et cetera, I can tell you your gut's not functioning well. If you have anything like chronic sinusitis, asthma, mood disturbance, sleep disorder, reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, or eczema, et cetera, I can tell you, you have a problem with your gut. If you're getting sick all the time with recurrent infection, you have a problem with your gut. So 
I zoom into the gut almost immediately and I change people's diets in the first visit while I'm awaiting lab data. And if people don't change their diets, it's unlikely to almost not, they're not going to get better. And if they do get better with whatever magic tools I have in my little bag of tricks like Felix, then those improvements are not going to be sustained. They will relapse. So people have to get on board in reducing their allostatic load of toxicity in order to get improvement. You have to decrease the toxic load because people's drains are filled. And that's why I practice a form of medicine called German biologic medicine. Because in addition to low-grade toxicity, you have to clear matrices around cells so people's drainage systems work better. So if they don't decrease the load internally, they're too toxic. And so over-toxicity and chronic low-grade inflammation are two of the baseline issues that are happening. My experience of the world is that most people who think they're well, you know, doing pretty well, have some degree of these things going on. They, they've got some inflammation, but not enough that they really feel it enough to deal to, to deal with it. They've got some toxins going on. Yeah, maybe their IQ could be five points higher, but you don't feel a five point swing in your IQ, even if you can measure it, if you go to the trouble of doing that. Um, what percentage of people listening to the show would you guess uh, are probably dealing with these kinds of issues to at least some degree? So you're not going to believe this number, and I'm going to throw it out there. Based on my clinical experience, I'd say 90%. Yeah. I'd say there's a small percentage of the super organic, super yoga people, super who practice what we do here as a religiosity. And I don't want to make people neurotic. That's not my goal. Yeah. What the heck am I doing if I make crazy families? I've done nothing. But I'd have to say majority, overwhelming majority have baseline low grade illness and things they've gotten used to dealing with. Uh, that's my experience as well. 90% is, is very accurate. And so you see you know, CEOs of a company or CEOs of companies walking around saying, you know, I feel pretty good. I'm doing all these things. You say, yeah, but is your mood stable? Like, can you remember all things you want to remember? Do you still have energy at the end of the day? And do you have muffin top and, and things like that? Yeah, oh yeah, but those are just minor and, and we tend to excuse them away. And the first step to performing better is you get rid of that stuff and then you can layer on other things that might be possible. So this is a conversation that isn't for just parents of sick kids or people who are chronically ill. This is a conversation for 90% of people listening and the other 10% probably already know it or they wouldn't be where they are now. Agreed. What's the first thing that uh, someone can do uh, to, to move the needle? Because let's face it, most people, we have commutes, we have families, we have jobs. We're probably not all going to go live in yoga retreats and live on organic farms. By the way, I live on an organic farm, uh, full disclosure. Uh, so, <laughs> like, uh, you know, what can we do as, as normal people in order to move the needle? Like, what's the first step? Okay. So, yes, I have a 20-year-old daughter working in an organic farm. Beautiful. Uh, to the shock of my, uh, her, her grandparents, farmer, you became a farmer. Um, so, okay, what do we do? So for me, I, I say this, it's a no brainer for me, but it may not be a no brainer for everyone. And I'm not trying to oversimplify this dialogue, but you have to eat organic food. And I go into in-depth conversation with moms, with dads, I say dads in the equation, how to begin to shop organic because we know that organic food is not subsidized and it's more expensive. Is it possible to stay in the same budget and eat organic? And I say, yes, I've done it. I converted a preschool to oil organic and went under budget. So it is possible, Dave. I don't want to hear, oh, we can't do it. Now, people live in food deserts, so it is way difficult for some people. I appreciate that. And I'm not trying to be, you know, elitist Marinite here because I've been accused of that. So we have to be careful. I say it's possible. We have to get away from processed foods, period. Everyone's got to cook. Little Susie and little Johnny can get in that kitchen. So simplistic, yes, absolutely necessary, yes. And we have to use a filtered water system. Mm -hmm. So if people can start there, just doing those basics, then they're going to start to feel better. And how do I know that? Kids in the book who I treated with homeopathic supplements, uh, you know, herbals, you know, my treatment patients. I had one family from the Central Valley where the dad had chronic renal failure. He only had 20% kidney function. His mom had it and his brother and his uh, nephrologist said, oh, it's some genetic thing that we don't know. Got his kid better with autism. All dad did was switch to organic. He was not my patient because, you know, I tell the family, 
everyone has to switch, not just the kid I'm treating. You can't give him kale salad and you're eating pepperoni pizza. No, doesn't work. Dad switched. Nine months later, goes to his nephrologist. He has 80% kidney function. And she said, how did you do it? He said, I went organic. She said, no way. Impossible. Oh, yes way. Because GMOs and their associated pesticides round up our kidney toxins. Uh, Dr. Pusti showed it. Dr. Serralini showed it. You know, many researchers have showed it. So be clear, when you remove the toxic element, people get better. That dad is remarkable. He got his kidney function back. Can you imagine? I have lots of stories like that. Anecdotal. I pay a lot of attention to that because uh, I only have one kidney. And I'm planning to live to at least 180 years old. So I kind of like to take care of it. So I, I remove kidney toxins from the things I do on a regular basis, like, you know, even some of the plant-based toxins like oxalic acid and some of the mycotoxins and anything else is going to lower or damage kidneys. I like to steer clear of it. And yeah, glyphosate is just bad news on, on many, many different levels. Uh, when it comes to going organic, um, I also hear that a lot, uh, not just, oh, it's expensive, but labor-saving devices have set people, particularly women, free. Like a lot of people don't know the incredible shift in society that happened as a result of baking powder. Because it used to be that moms had to wake up at five in the morning to knead the bread so it could rise so they could feed the family. And when baking powder came out, they're like, oh my God, I get to sleep an extra hour. And then we got washing machines and the latest version of that is called restaurants. I don't have to cook and do dishes. Oh my God, I'm going to go do it. I just interviewed Kimball Musk. I uh, was looking to bring a thousand restaurants to the country that are farm to table, organic, high standard, the kind of place you could eat. Do you see that kind of a vision happening where we're going to create a world where we can all go out to eat and still experience the benefits of organic and things like that? Or is, is that a pipe dream? Okay. Woo, you, God, woo, woo, woo. I'm doing deep breathing. Um, so you are so talking my language because the food movement began in the 60s when moms were told, okay, you're going back to work. We are going to be your new food. KFC did it. Um, McDonald's did it. And initially some of those foods weren't so bad, by the way. And they, oh, yeah. and they got worse over time. So it was part of the cultural shift. And all of a sudden, mom's life's a lot easier because in general, women are still doing the bulk of this work. Most of, yeah. in my practice, I take care of mostly women and their children. And that needs to shift. But Dave, let's put that, that thought just on the sidebar just for a second. So I don't have my families eat out. I say, you have to stop eating out. Eating out food is bad news. They use all the GMOs. And even when they're organic, are they truly organic? I don't know. So this idea of providing farm to table, all over it. Because how nice is it for us to occasionally eat out? So what I say is, and I've done this with several families in my community, you all have kids that are gluten and dairy intolerant. You all eat organic. Is it possible for you guys either to share a meal together once a week, and so you're now cooking mom and your kids can have a play date and or drop off food to your neighbor. And then you share, what a, what a concept, community sharing food. I've had families do this and it's successful. Now, to answer your, your question, until these restaurants get on board and providing us this farm to table food, I say it's doable. I just don't want to see the upper 1% having access to this and the rest of the US is still eating McDonald's. This is my concern about it, that it becomes very uh, 1%-y, and is this possible to bring it to the community? Now, here in Marin County and Sonoma, it's happening because Amy's, Amy's Organic Natural Food, has a, has a drive through in two locations in our area, and it is packed crowded, it's organic, and kids are sucking it down. So it's doable. You know, in, in Santa Monica, the Bulletproof Coffee Shop has a full kitchen and we do Bulletproof compliant meals, vegetable based, organic, as local as we can make it, grass fed, wild caught, all that stuff. And there are a lot of things you get for 10 bucks on the menu in Santa Monica, which is not a cheap neighborhood either. It's probably on par with Marin. And that's not a KFC and McDonald's level of affordable yet. But part of the reason that I do the show is when there's enough demand, when people start looking at junk food and saying, actually, that's not food, I don't eat rocks, I don't eat cactus, and I don't eat that, then the cost for organic, properly made food that supports our biology will drop just because the supply will go up. So the, the number of acres of grassland that's in production to feed animals instead of soy land sprayed with crap, 
uh, it it's changing and it, it's changing more rapidly than we can grow healthy soil and more rapidly than the food system can adapt. But the demand I think is there. So what I think both of us are asking people listening to do is to pay attention and to make those choices. And a follow on question to that assuming that, that people are going to do that. There are still some diets out there that advocate a cheat day where they're saying, oh, yeah, you should eat really good for you know, five days and then just go out and eat whatever you want. <laughs> Tell me what that does. If you're, I'm organic most of the time, and then I just have you know pizza wrapped around a synthetic cheesecake. And- so, okay, we're humans. We go to grandma's house. We 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 have dates. We go to restaurants. We go to the beach. We're we're at family members' houses. We don't practice our food beliefs. We don't want to be that person. Oh no, he's coming to dinner. So I f- often follow the eighty twenty rule. Can you eat well eighty percent of the time and twenty percent of the time you let your standards down? Now. It depends where you are in a treatment plan and how sick you are. So let's say you're a kid with just a little constipation, get you better. You have no other issues going on. You're all better. Yeah, that kid can do that. And I give mom and dad some tools to offset the GMOs, the glyphosate, the the, the gluten pizza, whatever they're doing. However, there are some people, some kids, some grownups who can't. Those might be people with autoimmune disease, chronic Lyme disease and co-infections, Um, cancers. And I say, no, you can't do it. Don't do it because the setback might be too much for them to rally back. It just depends where you are. And I am hardcore with those folks unless they've been symptom free for a few years. Now I have cheats. I use, I have homeopathic herbal and food cheats that I have. I give people to use when they're going to have that bad day. I have, let's say I might use NAC in high dose. I might use a homeopathic from Savine Pharma to offset, which has, which has homeopathic taraxicum in it, dandelion. Don't spray it, uh, eat it. I have um, a product from Supreme Nutrition that I like to offset glyphosate toxicity. I have a homeopathic product from Despio, at a cleanse when people I know are eating non-organic. So I have all these little things that people know how to use. I said, oh, okay, you're going there. Just make sure you bring your blank with you, take it before, during, and after the dose, you should do okay. What do you think about activated charcoal? If I'm going to eat something at a restaurant that's questionable, I always take that with food. Good idea, bad idea? I like activated char- charcoal. I'm not, I don't push any particular brands here. I know you have your product line and I- We, I, we do a charcoal too. You, <laughs> you do a charcoal too, thank you. I, I like to do what's, what works and you know you keep educating me and I am open to get people what works and as clean products as I possibly can. I am very snobbish about what's in my supplements for my patients. Where was this made from? GMO corn? No, thank you. You know, I want to know where it came from. Probiotics made by Dow? I don't think so, Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to be as good as I can, and your products, I am sure, are super clean, no GMOs. Well, thanks uh, for that. (laughs) Yeah. It is remarkably difficult sometimes when you're putting something together to actually get a manufacturer to tell you whether there's a GMO feedstock, and we don't we don't do that. Uh, like we we talk to the manufacturers and all that stuff, but it, it's like no, we're we're not putting something that that was fed GMOs in uh, because it's it's not in, in line with what we want. Like I don't want collagen from GMO fed cows, and there's there's companies selling uh, collagen from industrially ooh, fed chickens. Ooh, no. Uh, one one of my big concerns, and I'd like to know if you share this, is that glycine, the amino mm-hmm. acid that's uh, very prevalent in our collagen, our connective tissues, our fascia, um, the gly and glyphosate, it stands for glycine, yes. and, and it fits into collagen. So if you feed an animal corn, for GMO corn and soy, it's going to get glyphosate in its collagen, and then you make bone broth out of that. Like, oh, like, like, I, this seems like an extra way to concentrate it. Are you extra concerned about animals that concentrate glyphosate, or is it more about the food that has it on it specifically? Oh, dear. You must be sitting in my office, Dave. Um, years ago, I did email Stephanie Seneff, and I know this is her big thing, and she's the MIT researcher, as many of your listeners will know. And when I first- fo- Yeah, she- She's been on the show. She's yeah. been on the show. Okay. When I first started looking at um, glyphosate, you know, this was a million years ago, and I see it's n methylglycine, and I'm like, yeah, wait a minute. Glycine is, you know, an ubiquitous uh, non essential amino acid in kids' diets, is very important for body function in children. It, could there be some substitution going on? She said, yes. Now, there's a lot of controversy, yes, no, and I don't even want to get in that controversy. I say, 
is I'm going to practice something called the precautionary principle. If there's a possibility that this can be going on, I'm pulling it out till you give me more scientific data based on humans and not chickens and cows where I get most of my data now. It's so frustrating. So what I say is I need glycine. I used to prescribe glycine from a source until they could not tell me where that glycine came from. So now I tell all my moms and dads, you make your own bone broth made from your own chicken, turkey, beef, assuming you're not vegetarian, it has to be organic and make it yourself. I don't even trust the uh, product glycine that I was having people buy years ago. I stopped that and switched to a glycine, which is so beneficial for brain function and for kids who have elevated um, toxicant levels from, let's say, plastics, quinolinates, glycine can offset that when they have brain inflammation. I'm a big fan of glycine in children and adults. It's non-toxic and it's cheap. So I've had to switch my own methodology based on practicing precautionary principle. So I think there could be something there. Also, Dave, what I have found is people, adults and kids, are doughy. When I palpate them on physical exam, yes, I still examine my patients. Wow, what a, what a concept. Um, they are doughy. I'm like, what the heck? Now, if people say, oh, everyone's in front of their their you know device all day. Yeah, maybe true. They don't feel good to me. Could, because glycine is one of the major amino acids and collagen oh, in, in your musculature. So I'm thinking, huh, could this be related? I'm always asking the question. I don't have all the answers. And so I say bone broth. And I make families make bone broth in everything they cook, in their rice, in their veggies, you know, put it in everything. And that's what I have uh, parents do. We always have a pot of it boiling in Santa Monica at the restaurant. And I use bone broth at home. Sometimes we make it and sometimes I just use lots of collagen protein, um, which, yeah, it's from grass-fed cows. I know because we make it. But uh, it, it's a, a big source of glycine because it's yes. also a, a less inflammatory amino acid than a lot of the other proteins that we eat. And my kids are, uh, they live at a level of health that I never experienced as a kid at, at all. And they recover quickly from infections and scratches and, and just have, have energy in a way that, that seems unusual these days. And I like to think it's because we feed them very well most of the time. And I, I had, they had a conversation, um, with a friend and basically did some food shaming about going to McDonald's. And I'm like, look, people are gonna eat what they're gonna eat kids and you know, people make their own choices and that's not cool. So I'm gonna take you to McDonald's and I'm in internally going, oh, like I, I, it's gonna hurt to feed the kids this. But I said, you're gonna get a toy, you're gonna get to play, you're gonna get pie and ice cream and it, it's gonna be great. And, and they both looked at me and, and they said, seriously? And I said, yeah. Uh, it, it's going to be fun. It'll taste good. And they said, Daddy, we know how we feel when we eat food that's not good for us. We, we don't feel good. You can't make us go. <laughs> and, and they rebelled. I'm like, okay, either I succeeded as a dad or maybe there'll be a huge backlash and that's all they're going to eat when they're 15. But that that's one mindset. But how do you how do you deal with parents who don't have kids that, that effectively uh, brainwashed maybe or just well-educated? Uh, when when you're there, kids, I'm at a party. You know, everyone else is having McNuggets. You know, what what do I do? Uh, how does that conversation go when you're talking with a mom? It says like like my daughter wants cake. Like, what do you say? Okay, so you are you are right again. Now you're in my office at, at work. You've gone from my personal office to my home office because I've had this conversation. So you don't want that your kid to be that kid who comes with their vegan cupcakes, okay? And the rest of the kids are eating, you know, Safeway, uh, all those cupcakes. That's really hard too. Okay. Uh, so I know that's mm -hmm. hard. However, if I am, if I've got that kid who's a newly treat, I'm treating a kid on the autistic spectrum and I'm just starting and we are just starting to get this kid better. I say, you will be that mom who sends those vegan cupcakes and you're going to call that mom or dad. I keep saying mom, that parent and say, listen, little Susie and Johnny are coming with their vegan cupcakes. Please just put it out with the other kid, kids cupcakes. Don't really single them out. And if they do just explain it to the other kids that he has a food allergy or something. And that's what we're doing. So it depends. However, if your kid is for the most part, like your children healthy and they're at a birthday party, I let them eat that stuff and offset it with my little homeopathics or whatever before and after the event. And I say, let's just offset your gut. Some kids rebalance themselves. They don't need anything. What I don't know, and I've asked myself this question many times, 
There are some of us who can tolerate more glyphosate, more GMOs than others. We're individuals. We have a more robust immunity, constitution, vital force, chi, whatever, and we can tolerate more than there are others who don't have as robust a constitution. So depending on that kid, so I tell mom or dad, what's your kid like? Is your the kid who's going to unravel after eating all that sugar? Or your kid, eh, they're pretty good. Let them answer. And then I deal with them. I say, okay, your kid's the one who unravels. I give them certain supplements or whatever I'm doing. Your kid's okay. Let them ride. Just give them some more probiotics or sauerkraut juice the next day or whatever you like to use. So I try to make it individualized, practical, non-shaming, not marginalizing the child who's involved or the parent for that matter, and not make it a big deal. For most kids now in the world, particularly here in the U.S., there are so many kids with food allergies per classroom. Oh, yeah. It's not a thing. They said, oh, yeah, she's gluten intolerant. He's got dairy sensitivity. It's so widespread that kids are used to hearing about food um, dis- discretions. So this is to give you a flavoring of how I might approach this uh, clinically. Do you recommend uh, like a vegan diet for autistic kids or other conditions and things like that? Like, like what's, what's your take on how you know, how do you know what diet to use where? So prescribing diets, boy, if I could go back and learn more about nutrition, I would, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I need to be a holistic nutritionist and I may get the help of some of my colleagues if I can't do it. I try and do what I can and refer when I need it. However, kids on the spectrum, which is now one in 34 boys, one in 68 kids, um, is massive. So they have some of the sickest guts I've ever seen clinically. They have the worst gut profile. Their guts are not good. And they have some of the most inflammation, the worst gluten and dairy sensitivities and the whole lot. So um, for a lot of those kids, I do food eliminations and I tend to lead toward paleo or paleo-like or GAPS diet by uh, Natasha Campbell McBride or something like that. Um, I tend to lead more paleo. If they are strict vegetarian and they say there is no way we are letting our kid eat this, I supplement with additional proteins, um, uh, protein powders and supplements. I do, depending on what I'm treating based on lab data. If I get it back, um, I'll either do a nutritional profile, let's say from Genoma, the Genova pediatric profile and see what I need to do based on lab data. So I tend to pull most kids with issues off gluten and dairy, occasionally soy. I lean toward paleo-like, and I can tailor it, gaps on occasion. Um, I do decrease fish intake no more than once a week because of heavy metal toxicity. That's pretty clear to me. Even little fish like anchovies and things like that as well because they swim along the bottom and pick up a lot of the bottom stuff off our oceans. And um, then if I need more help, as I was saying, Dave, I refer to a holistic nutritionist or a functional nutritionist to help me out um, because some parents say, I need more guidance. And I say, absolutely. I give them websites and refer them. So I kind of have a blend of what I do, but I'm a big fan of paleo. I've done a keto for, I know you're a fan of keto. I love keto too for certain people. C- cyclical keto. The bull, bull, if, if you're saying keto all the time, your gut bacteria won't be happy. No, that, that's a cor- no more than a thing. month. I don't pick, keep people on keto yep. for more than a month and I haven't come off of it because the um, pro their own microbiome profile will change within three days on keto. And I'm like, yeah. mm, I'm not so sure if that's a great idea. Once we do what we're trying to do, if I have a cancer patient, that's different. Okay. Let's put cancer on the side. There's a whole other yeah. ball of wax and sugars and inflammation, et cetera. But keto, no more than a month. And all I'll do sometimes an intermittent fasting diet to jumpstart them um, or have them try not to eat like for 14 or 16 hours, you know, last meal, 4 p.m. And then try not to eat till the morning. So this just depends on the person and what they can do. If someone says, yo, Dr. Pero, I cannot fast from 4 p.m. to like 7 a.m. I say, OK, this is not right for you. What can we do? How can we individualize it to make it work for you so I don't drive you crazy? What's the role of toxic mold in all of this? Oh, dear. Toxic mold. Oh, oh dear. Um, oh, where do <laughs> I begin? So 20, 30 years ago, nobody had toxic mold. All of a sudden, everybody has toxic mold. What happened? Did all of a sudden we all became mold sensitive? So I think I, I have read Dr. Richie Shoemaker's stuff. You know, I've, 
I've really tried to understand mm-hmm. the mold issue. Who really has mold issue? Mold testing is very difficult. And I'm not sure the oh, yeah. very expensive urine test you can do for mold really reflects what's happening with you, by the way. So this is what I say about mold. If you have gut issues, immune impairment, chronic tick-borne infection, co-infections, um, yeast overgrowth for any particular reason, I worry about mold. If you have chronic sinusitis um, and brain fog, I worry about mold. If you have a home that is positive mold, hello, I worry yeah. about mold. <laughs> so I am a firm believer if we don't decrease the external milieu and have people lower their mold exposure, they're not going to get better. I believe it's a thing now because of immune dysfunction and everything that's happened to our guts, because your listeners know that 70% of immune function is from the gut, some people 80%. And this relationship to the microbiome, mold, mold toxin is linked. Then I say, this is why I think we have so many people now suffering from mold is because of chronic immune dysfunction from chronic gut dysfunction, from a combination of GMOs, pesticides, and pick your poison, plastics, solvents, um, air pollution, uh, EMF exposure. I focus on food, uh, you know, in my line of work, but there are many factors, many, many, many factors that I will deal with with my patients over time. And so that's why I think it's a problem. Mold is hard to treat, but there are there are therapies that work, yes. and I use combination therapies of homeopathy, antibiotics, whether pharmaceutical or herbal. Sometimes I bring in the big guns. I have to. Various inhalational treatments, upping their oxidative uh, glutathione so they can um, – I'll do inhaled glutathione, various types mm-hmm. of glutathione, um, and while clearing out their houses. One of the interesting things about glyphosate is – in fact, I have a couple studies. I think they're in the Bulletproof Diet – where they show that when you spray glyphosate on soil, that aspergillus, which makes most of the nasty mold toxins, increases its <laughs> toxin output by a hundred times. And those same angry molds get in your drywall. And I think we're just dealing with species that make a lot more toxin than they used to. And uh, I, I know in my own path, uh, figuring out that I grew up in a basement that had toxic molds and I had you know, frequent bruising, nosebleeds five, 10 times a day, asthma, eczema, all, all this stuff that's actually, those are all clear signs of, uh, of mold exposure. Uh, that definitely affected my, my resilience as you know, my body was growing, which wasn't a good thing. So I, I'm like, if I could lose a hundred pounds and have a brain that works like mine works now, coming from that far behind, uh, that most people aren't dealing with anywhere near that level of crap. And I've had Lyme disease diagnosed in, in multiple ways and different doctors thought I had you know, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. And all of those are manifestations of toxic burden. And you can get rid of the toxins and you can cause healing. But yeah, mold is is annoying and it's a, a systems problem in the environment that's tied to food too. You, you breathe it, it's horrible for you. And if you're eating something that's high in stuff that attacks your kidneys and you have a detox problem, you're dealing with something there too. So I, people say, what's the one cause? And I don't always have an answer for them. And it doesn't sound like you do either. It sounds like you're looking at the system of everything in the body. You're focusing on food, uh, food, I don't know, food first, food early on, uh, and then taking next steps just based on clinical experience. Is that kind of a good summary of how you think about it? David, excellent summary. And as a matter of fact, you've become a, a clinician uh, in, 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 in front of me before my eyes. Indeed, I think that is indeed true. Glyphosate in chickens, um, chicken study, removed um, beneficial bacteria, lactobacillus and bifido. Those beneficial bacteria keep your fungi in check. We all have fungi in our, in our body, but it's in a balance. They're all in a balance, by the way. So when, when the beneficials that keep molds of various fungi in check diminish, and we have beneficial bacteria from our noses down to our tush, okay, there are various microbiomes in every part of our body, our sinuses, our eyes, our oral cavity, you know, um, our colon. We have communities of organisms. When you have an overgrowth of fungi and they love to extend their hyphae and get into things, they can be very difficult to eradicate and they produce toxins, right? Which we are also sensitive to. So then what happens is if your immune system can't handle it, like you're saying, or you're constantly in a glyphosate, which is an antibiotic, which does indeed change the soil, then we have this couple things going on. We have 
chronic inflammation. We have this mold overgrowth, fungi overgrowth, as well as toxin happening. And then we have um, insufficient nutrients because even organic food is not nutrient rich enough. So we don't have the nutrient levels we need to supply these systems, brain, immune system, you know, uh, um, neuroendocrine, hormonal, et cetera. And it creates this toxic soup. So to remove those mold toxins requires a multi-pronged approach in getting better. The last thing one must appreciate is that organisms are very clever and they work in these biofilms, okay? Like plaque, plaque is a biofilm. So if you have immune system impairment, like you did, um, unfortunately, and mold can do it too, then what happens is you have these little rafts. And I have heard no one uh, discuss this as brilliantly as Dr. Klinghart. Oh, yeah. uh, I've heard him speak on this and I'm going, oh my God, thank you so much. And mold is often at the bottom of the raft and then you have bacteria, then you have viral particles and you have to, as you're treating patients, people, disassemble these rafts. And that is something not in Western thinking that not only do you treat the infection or it's toxic or it's toxin, you have to treat the biofilms where they live so you can release them. But if you're releasing them, you need to give them some coverage to offset what you're releasing. You just can't release them and say, okay, good luck. You have to give them some type of antimicrobial coverage, whether it's pharmaceutical, herbal, or homeopathic, or and or, and or mind body. So you need to give them the, tool, the tools as you, as you begin to treat them. So it's complex. And this is hard to do on your own. You really need to be in the hands of an integrative practitioner who can help guide you. And often I don't deal with the mold issue to the very end of treatment, but I have them decrease their external environment almost immediately in treatment. It's funny you mentioned hyphae, the little roots that come out of mold when it starts to grow. And it turns out there's bacteria that will eat hyphae as they come out. And I actually started a company that makes a probiotic you spray around the house so that if there are spores and there is moisture, that the bacteria eats the mold as it tries to grow and keeps it from happening, uh, which is something that I, I spray it in my house every couple of weeks. So I, I, I like that. I, I, feel, I feel good about that. Dude, I didn't know about that. And that's freaking brilliant. I'm going to tell you, Dave, I didn't know about that product. And when we're done with this, I am going to get online and send me some links. I'm going to look at that. It's, I love it. Okay. It, it's, called, it's called Home Biotic. But it, it's one of those things, it's non, you wouldn't think of that, right? But the idea is, look, there's spores everywhere. Like, like we live on Earth, and the bacteria and the molds and the fungi, they own the Earth. They have for billions of years, and they'll be around if, if we're ever not around. And you got to manage the environment instead of just like spray pesticide on everything because it doesn't work to make it sterile. It doesn't work to kill it because it just comes back more pissed off. But if you create the balance, whether it's in your gut, whether it's in your house, whether it's on your field and the farm, it seems like that's the way to have higher performing humans, kids who don't get sick, uh, people without the neurological stuff that's going on, which is the next thing I want to ask you about. But so before we leave your product, because, okay. you know, my brain is going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, I'm very cautious about like a lot of parents, for example, use humidifiers. Right. Oh, God. So right away, <laughs> mm -hmm, right away, I'm thinking, huh, normally I have them clean it out with white vinegar. But what if they were able to spray a couple of sprays of your product, you know, in the water, which I'm always worried about, I'll use like colloidal silver, I'll use white vinegar, you know, because I am worried about mm -hmm. spewing mold spores from, you know, that, uh, these little germ fest humidifiers or wherever else, particularly with kids who have chronic asthma, who use these nebulizers. I'm always like, mm -hmm. oh, wait a second, making sure that everything is clean. So this, you've just spurred me to some very good thoughts. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, you're you're so welcome. I, I remember as a as a kid, I, I was in this this room as a fully finished nice basement, and it had been flooded from something before we even moved into the house. And my room had wood paneling, so behind the paneling was clearly moldy. And because I had asthma, we'd put a humidifier in there, and it was always worse with a humidifier because I was actually <laughs> making a humid environment. Uh, and so, like we we tested the bacterial strain. Uh, in rooms, or not in rooms, but on drywall with 32 degrees centigrade, so very warm with 98% humidity. And for two weeks, there was no growth. Wow. Whereas the control was 50% covered and it was inoculated with toxic mold. So I, I but I've never, like, we never tested putting it in a humidifier, but it, it's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. And that that idea, though, that, that wait, you mean making the, the place moist might be bad for me? Well, yeah, it can, but it might also be good. And, 
And it's how are we to know as, as human beings and parents and people who maybe aren't focused on our environment all the time because we wanted to you know, write a book or be a good parent or go to work and all these other things, uh, there, there must be tools given all the technology we have uh, to make it easier to know what's going on and easier to control what's going on. And, and that's the essence behind epigenetics, the study of how the environment uh, affects our genetic expression and the art and science of biohacking, a field that I, that I named. Uh, so how do you change the environment around you so you have control? And yeah, I didn't have a lot of that when I was young, so maybe that's why I like to do it. But the idea is whether you're sick or not, you still want to have that control. And since you and I both think 90% of people out there who think they're doing pretty well have some degree of sick, but not enough, this is the human condition. And, and we, we have to do this at every level, but we don't have to do it individually. You go to experts, and eventually the knowledge that you have is going to make its way into the way we build buildings, into the way we run restaurants. And, and that is the world that is coming really rapidly way more rapidly than a lot of big industry food companies think right now. And it's inevitable because it's too easy for you and me and everyone else to communicate. The, the couple hundred thousand people who hear this, they might make small changes, but when you do this and you amplify it times the internet, sorry, like the demand for crappy environments is going down, which means we have to build good ones. So I don't get off my soapbox. There's no question for you there, but I'm just kind of passionate <laughs> about this. Uh, I appreciate your passion and I, I am, we are like-minded in this and um, I agree with you. It's called increasing consciousness. And what I tell families to do, humans to do, it doesn't have to be somewhat kids, is do both. Use the humidifier, just an example. Are they better or worse? Use without it. Use, yeah. know your own family, know yourself, observe. I don't take care of you. I provide guidelines. You take care of you and you observe. Here are my suggestions. It's different from your Western pr practitioner. Okay, fine. You observe. What do you notice? Here are the things to look for. I tell parents, I tell people, these things will get better or worse. And I'll give you what they are. Make it simple. You're not physicians. And I say, here, these are the parameters you're going to check. Are these things better? Are these things worse? And then act accordingly. You also, by doing it yourself somewhat, empower people that they can do this themselves and protect the body's innate ability to heal itself. And that's what we're trying to resurrect, Dave. We're trying to get this body to heal itself, which it can do by giving it the right tools and removing the extraneous forces, preventing it from healing. When you started your career, uh, and certainly when I was younger, it, it seemed like there was a mindset that said, look, if if you if you're feeling really tired, you sort of feel like crap. It's probably because you're not trying hard enough, right? It, it it's a willpower, it's a moral issue. It's because you're lazy, right? And yeah, maybe you're a little tired or something, but you know, just kind of walk it off. And I've evolved in my own mindset to think, look, if you're feeling tired or your things just aren't working right, it's your fault. <laughs> and it's your fault not because of moral weakness or laziness. It's your fault because there's something you can do to change it, and it didn't happen randomly. And when I was young, it was it just it was something that happened to you, but it was out of your control. And now it looks like with this huge set of new knowledge that we have, there's usually a reason, and it might take you two years to find the reason. But if you give up and just assume it's you know an act of God or just bad luck, uh, that you're 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 selling yourself short. Uh, do you believe that? that for almost any of these things that there's a, a path out of it? Or do you think there are some people who are just screwed? I, I believe for most of us, there's a path out of it. And we just have to figure what that root cause is because we all have different root causes. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea is many of us don't feel well. I, I believe to be totally accurate. You know, this Western mindset is a, come on, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. You know, you're just being lazy. That may be true 40 years ago, not true anymore because people and children really don't feel well. And this is true. So I would say that the majority of people can heal. Absolutely. And it takes knowledge, but chronic disease is not well addressed in traditional or Western medicine. And they really need to do integrative health. And there aren't that many integrative practitioners. For acute issues, Western medicine is fabulous. You know, you break your leg, you're hit by a car, you have a heart attack. Oh my God, Western medicine is unparalleled. However, chronic issues, chronic migraines, chronic fatigue, chronic Lyme, chronic abdominal pain, chronic constipation are not well addressed in traditional medicine and need this broader palette and people need to seek out integrated practitioners and there are many types and i believe most of us the majority have the potential to get better somewhat but when i hear someone like you share your story dave thank you for that 
It's so profound. You are one of the super sick people. It took you years and billions of dollars. Well, <laughs> not quite, but to couple hundred, couple yeah. hundred to get better. Most of us are not quite there, fortunately. No. But you're an extreme, and you got better. But it took everything you know how to do. And plus, how lucky was I? I made six million dollars when I was twenty six years old, and recognized that my brain was wrecked. In fact, I lost it when I was twenty eight. Kind of sucked, <laughs> but. Uh, but along the way, like what a gift, right? So now I know what I know, but if I hadn't have had that, I would have been on disability. Like, like just to be really, I bought disability insurance at 20, 25, 26 years old. Cause the doctor said I was fine. Uh, so I could buy insurance, but I, I like, something's not right here. And, uh, no one should have to do that. And there's no reason for that. It was just a lack of knowledge. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I'm on the mission I'm on because like every every time a conversation like the one we're having now gets amplified, there will be hundreds or thousands of people who maybe dodge a bullet like that because it kind of sucked and no one should have to do that. And you know, it's interesting about what you're saying. It reminds me of something that we, we wrote about a bit in the book about the warrior moms, but and there's the traditional medicine, you know, in Canada, in the mm -hmm. US, you know, Western medicine, my little fingers are waving in the air. But there's also a whole universe of a parallel practice of often driven by women who are seeking treatments for their children, running parallel to the Western system, looking at ozone, looking at uh, these integrative tools, going to holistic practitioners, and whether their kids have ADHD or autistic spectrum, or you name it, they're out there and they are taking charge. And I could think of so many moms, like there's a mom in this movie that uh, Jeffrey Smith and Amy Hart just did called Secret Ingredients, and it'll be released soon. The mm -hmm. mom, Kathleen DeKiara, in that movie, healed her own children and then became a holistic nutritionist. But moms like Kathleen, like so many, are saying, you know what? What you're telling me is not resonating. You're not getting to the root cause. You're only giving Band-Aids, pill for ill medicine. I don't want it. I'm going to seek integrative, alternative, complementary, whatever treatments, and they're out there. So we, as Western practitioners, which I still kind of call myself in theory, must mm -hmm. open our minds, Google, for Pete's sake, some of these things. It doesn't take you know rocket science here. Look to people like you who have businesses providing these supplements, which is what people want, and they work. And so we have to expand. I'm hoping the book will do that. I am hoping whatever will do it is to get the Western mindset off the pharmaceutical controlled death grip it has on our training of young docs into looking at these other mindsets, because that's what it's going to take. There is a death grip by industry on our education, on our institutions of education um, it's another pet peeve of mine in something I'm very passionate about. Uh, my wife is a medical doctor from the Karolinska Institute and has similar things to say. She was horrified, especially when she came to the U S and said, you mean this is, this class was paid for by a drug company, like conflict of interest. So it, it's not the same everywhere, but it's getting worse everywhere. Do you believe the pharmaceuticals are always bad? No, gosh, no. So many amazing drugs. That, thank you for many. that. Many. <laughs> are you kidding? Uh, you know, from whether you you need a vasodilator, a bronchodilator, um, you need an antibiotic. They are, can be amazing. I have a prescription pad on my desk. And if I have a great drug to fix your urinary tract infection or to give you, to help you with, you know, your, your insulin for your sugar control, hell, I'm going to use it. So- I never throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I love Western medicine. I did it for decades in the emergency room providing that very treatment. So there's an absolute need. Okay. That's an important point. I, I freaking love pharmaceuticals. And, and someone's going to take that and make that their ringtone now. But but here's here's the deal. Uh, if you use them all the time, use them uh, without knowing what the side effects are, it's bad. But there are a cadre of people, some who listen to the show, who are are... I never use a pharmaceutical. I never would. It's like, no, <laughs> it's okay to use any technology available to solve your problem. As long as the rewards outweigh the risks and the downside. And it's just that we've tipped the needle so far that we're willing to throw the drugs at the problem without looking at the cause of the problem. And we don't look at the side effects of the drugs. But if you have a balanced view, uh, which is what you get from functional medicine, from the kind of work that you practice, um, you end up with a, a rich palette of very powerful tools to control the state of your body. And you can turn off inflammation maybe in a way that you weren't going to get just from your diet. And maybe you only did it for a week, but it was enough to get you over the hump. Those things are, are precious gifts. And and it's it's 
awesome to be able to look at both sides of it without being so dogmatic that you always throw a drug at it or you never would. So I'm, I'm happy that you're able to, to talk about that. Dave, absolutely. You know, in the pragmatic approach to medicine, you know, one of the kids in, in this, in the gal in the book that we talk about, she had chronic Lyme disease and everything else. And I, at some point during our treatment, she got two antibiotics and they were life-saving for her. And most of us say my Lyme patients will get antibiotics at some point, um, often pharmaceutical antibiotics. Um, and I say, thank you universe, um, for providing those. And, um, can we possibly be open as practitioners to the varied palette. Yeah. We need a wide and broad palette to treat our present uh, children and their parents. Well, I have one more question for you, Michelle, or Dr. Perro. Michelle, yes, no, it's Michelle, <laughs> please. If someone came to you tomorrow, you didn't know their clinical history, and they said, I'm a normal human being, and I wanna perform better at everything I do in my life, what would your top three pieces of advice be for them? Okay. A normal human just wants to feel better. Um, see those sometimes on occasion. There are a couple, like two out there. I say, this is what I say. Eat organic as best you can and, and a water filter the best you can. Do the best you can. Um, eat, you know, and non-processed food. You know, but that's one. Number two, I say, live with humor and find joy in your life. So whatever it is you're doing, come from a place of joy. Which, and also that m means giving back to the best joy I have is when I give back. And it's so selfish because I get way more than I've actually given. So it's a, can you do that? And three, can you possibly find ways for that human to decrease your stress level? We all have increased stress, no doubt, in 2018 with the way our lives are set up. I don't know many people who don't have stress. Poor, rich, black, white is almost universal. And I say, can you find a way to decrease your own stress level, whether you dance, whether you hike, whether it's yoga, I prefer a physical outlet if possible, meditation included, but whatever it takes for you, doesn't have to, you don't have to sit on a mountaintop chanting. What would it look like for you? And find ways, and what I'm really trying to do is balance the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems to be in harmony. And so if that's all they ask me, I say, can you find those three things? And those things don't cost much and anybody can do them and you can do them at home. Beautiful. Now, bonus question, normally end the show with that question, but you've talked about water filters <laughs> three times. I've got my opinions on them. What is your most highly recommended form of water filtration? Oh dear. Oh, such another, Dave, you're, these are complicated <laughs> questions because my favorite one is often expensive and uses a lot of water, which yeah. is reverse osmosis. And I don't feel comfortable recommending, especially here in the state of California, which is so drought prone, a system that uses more water. I can in good conscience recommend that. And it's so expensive to install. So what I tell most folks is use some kind of carbon-based filter, mm -hmm. either on your fridge or on your faucet, you know, replaceable. Remember to replace it. Can you possibly use that? And I believe it or not, I stick to that as a baseline for most people without bankrupting them is to say a carbon-based filter. I really try to get the halogens out of there, um, like fluorine and chlorine and et cetera. Um, I try to get the uh, heavy metals out of there so we don't have another Flint, Michigan, which is part of the whole U.S. is Flint. I don't know what's happening in Canada. Um, and so as a baseline. And then from there, if they can afford a bit more, it, you know, on the budget, I say, um, I might send them to EWG, Environmental Working Group, that has a great paper on water filter systems. And I say, buy within your budget. Yeah, paying attention to budget matters a lot. And I, I encourage people to put a whole house carbon block filter on, which if you do it yourself is going to run about $300. And then everything in the house gets cleaned, which is cool, including your shower and, and all of that. And you see, you can add a sediment filter and a virus filter and all sorts of cool things like that. But that doesn't take extra water like reverse osmosis does. And if you're going to drink it, it might have a little bit of reverse osmosis. If you can afford to install it under your sink, you're looking at 800 bucks to do that, uh, which is not a small amount of water, but it's cheaper than bottled water over time. So, and it's also cleaner. And no bottled water, yeah. no, no plastic, zero plastic. I mean, it's it's breaking down. It's in the ocean, and these little nanoparticles of plastics—they are awful for us. And I say, and if you when you take water off your sink, you know, if you have a filter that you use or a carbon-based filter, I love your idea of a carbon block filter. By the way, I love that. Then bring your bottle or your stainless steel with you. Um, I travel with mine wherever I go. Beautiful. 
Thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. People can find out more about your work on gmoscience.org. That's the URL. Uh, that is www.gmoscience.org. We have a great group um, bringing this information on GMOs and pesticides to folks um, with a health focus. That is our, our mission. Beautiful. Dr. Michelle Perrault, thanks again for being on the show. Dave Asprey, my pleasure. If you liked today's episode, you know what to do. Head on over to bulletproof.com slash iTunes and leave a review so someone else can figure out that the show is worth their time. Or go over to gmoscience.org and learn a few things about what use of this kind of pesticide or herbicide, whatever you want to call it, glyphosate, is doing to you, or heavy metals, or any of these other things we talked about. Bottom line is, you have a lot more control over how you perform, how you feel, how long you're going to live, how you're going to look than you probably thought you did, but you're not going to get what you want by changing just one thing. You change the system that you live in, you change the system of your body, and it's kind of amazing what's possible.